Welcome back, true believer. Can't I get you anything? Some Merry Marvel mayhem to get the old pulse pounding. Hey there, true believers. Joshua Westbrook here with some more Merry Marvel mayhem to get the old pulse pounding. Marvel Animation's X-Men 97 has just finished their first season, and my goodness, what a season it was. I, I love the X-Men. Uh, not as much, obviously, as Spider-Man, but um, I do love the X-Men. Uh, Cyclops especially. Look, look what I got right here. It's my guy Cyclops. Um, and this show did him justice, my goodness. I'm going to basically give a kind of review, kind of my thoughts on the show, the first season, now that it's done. Um... That being said, there will be spoilers, full spoilers for the entire show. So if you haven't seen it, just check out now, come back later. Uh, and, you know, catch what I gotta think of X-Men 97. I'll go episode by episode with this. I think that's the easiest way to go. Starting with the first episode, jump right into it. To me, my X-Men, which Cyclops said in the middle of the episode. Kind of the middle. It's a popular phrase from the x-men comics um xavier usually says it but cyclops says it um also as well so the first episode um of the show was my favorite episode for the longest time until my new favorite episode came on i'll tell you when that one comes up in the order but uh it was such a great way to reintroduce the x-men after being gone for so many years i mean clearly not i the x-men show the 90s series I should say, because the X-Men have been around movies and comics. I mean, Marvel tried to erase them for a little bit there, but it, it didn't work. The X-Men uh, will always persevere, which this show showed pretty well. Um, just like I said earlier, my boy Cyclops showed out in this episode. The way he was using his optic blast is was so creative and like, Nothing I've ever seen before, especially in uh, animation or, you know, motion. He, he was blasting and using his the concussive force of his optic blast to move across the room when he was fighting the Friends of Humanity. That was that was A plus Cyclops. That was A plus X Men. A storm coming in through the roof with the grand I am Storm, Mistress of the Elements. Like you can't you can't get that in. Like, I, I immediately got hit with the nostalgia. I immediately got hit with the uh, grand epicness of what the X-Men are and what the X-Men can be. And what I really liked about the first episode so much is that it was the X-Men on top of their game, essentially. It was them showing up, kicking butt. They beat down the Friends of Humanity. Um, they saved Sunspot. They beat down the Sentinels after they interrogated Gyrick. Gene using Cerebro to pull the information out of him. Like, every X-Men had their... A plus moment. Cyclops was saving Roberto uh, Storm with the Omega level mutant moment at the end, just destroying all the Sentinels nearly effortlessly. Uh, Wolverine and Morph, Morph turning into Blob after Wolverine's like Morph belly up, and he bounces off of him and just flies through Master Mold's head. Beast taking over a Sentinel, Gambit Rogue. <laughs> Goodness, they they all did so good. They all did so good in the first episode, and that's what I really liked about it. It was fun, it was action-packed, it was epic, it was everything I had hoped that the series would be personified. They did not miss a beat in that first episode, bro. Um, and then, of course, it ended with the twist of Magneto coming back and taking over with his, to me, my X-Men, which leads us to episode two, which is Mutant Liberation Begins. Where Magneto was trying to be a good guy. And it was hard for him, obviously, because he's not really really uh, the good guy, you know. He, of course, wants freedom for all mutant kind, which is, I suppose, a good goal. But Magneto's always gone about it in the complete wrong way, which is why he often ends up on the wrong side of the X-Men and Xavier. Um, I really liked how like Magneto was flying around and saving humans, but... Um, he he had like disgust in his voice when he was discussing Charles' dream when Cyclops questioned him. He's like, uh, "I'm here to you know reenact Charles or relive live out Charles's dream of human mutant." And he's like, "Oh, coexistence." I almost made him want to vomit when he said it. Uh, that's Magneto's always been such a complex character. He's a pretty cool villain. Um, 
and when he's when he's more nuanced like this when like he's he's trying to do the right thing when he's working with the x-men it always just adds to some more compelling character moments to magneto because it's easy to just throw him in the corner and paint him as a villain but like when he has points you know when he's when you're sitting there like well i mean magneto's kind of got a point that's when magneto's at his best when he's doing the things that you know people wish they could do which leads to the city hall uh the capitol building attack with from the fans of humanity when executioner blasted storm which got me by but let me tell you i've read x-men comics but not nearly as many as i've read spider-man comics so a lot of the stories they used in this show were uh, a surprise to me and new to me and i appreciate that because you know I, like I appreciate, I I like it when I watch a show or a movie, and I'm like, hey, oh, I know where they're going with this. I know what's coming, but like, it's it's often it's it's better sometimes. I feel when I'm surprised by something. So the fact that I wasn't familiar with all the X Men stories they used in this season was good uh, for me at least, um, because I didn't know how they begin, middle, and ended. Uh, so I was able to kind of experience them firsthand and like some of them I knew of, you know, but I didn't like, I never read the story. So like I had, sometimes I had an idea of what they were doing, but I, you know, I'll get into that. I'll get into that. So, um, I had no idea about life, death, uh, storm losing her powers like that. So when she got blasted by executioners, uh, basically the collar technology, the, uh, power dampening technology, but focused as beast said with enough radiation to sap her powers for good i was (laughs) i i was floored because after she just had that big moment in episode one and then they just take her powers i was upset and so going back to what i was saying i knew doing what everyone wants to do (laughs) he grabbed executioner and slammed him against the ground pinned him to the seal and then took them all up to space like that's that's what, because like at that point, you know, you just watched Storm, our African queen, the goddess, okay, just get blasted, get her powers, as my you said, splayed on the floor, powerless, reaching for the wind, unable to grab it. And everybody wanted to beat the crap out of the executioner at that point. I certainly wanted to. So, Magneto taking them up to space and giving them that message, like, I'm trying to do the right thing and you guys are making it really hard please stop doing that like that was that that that's like i said peak magneto uh peak magneto so let's move on to episode three fire made flesh um again i didn't read the inferno storyline but i was aware of it i knew of maddie pryor nathan cable all that i so i i i knew once at the end of episode two, another gene showed up at the door. I'm like, this is Goblin Queen. This is Mr. Sinister. They're doing this. Um, and it, it it was, first of all, the visuals in this episode were frightening. <laughs> it, it, this is when, it, it, like, the first two episodes, they kind of eased you into it. Because the show, yeah, it had a more mature tone to it. Like, there was when executioner beat cyclops up he got a little bloody and they were dropping some minor swears so i was like okay like you know it's 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 a little bit it's matured a little bit for you know, everybody that was watching in the 90s is now my age so you know they they aged it up a little bit but this episode was <laughs> like okay uh when all the creepy things were crawling out of the tv and the demon sentinel imagery and uh <laughs> rogue and magneto melding together that's another storyline from the comics i was like i was aware of that image of rogue hugging magneto uh but i never knew that they were like a thing a thing you know i had always seen that image but i had never really known of the story to accompany it so gambit finding out that rogue and magneto were uh as morph said training their stamina (laughs) training their stamina um yeah that that was wild we figured that out in episode two i believe yes uh where rogue could touch magneto because his electromagnetic field can like 
make it thin enough where they can touch. That was just some nasty business, bro. X-Men always comes with the drama, with the love triangles, with the... <laughs> with the it, it, it's, it's X-Men. It's X-Men. You expect messy drama like that. And <laughs> so I, I was off-put. By the, number one, the creepiness of Mag- however old Magneto is and Rogue being however old she is, it, 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 there's a there's an age gap. So it's, it's a little creepy, it's a little weird, and it was happening in the X-Mansion under everyone's nose, so that was creepy. But yeah, it was super creepy uh, The when they were melting together that, in, in uh, Madeline's Inferno per se. Um, Morph got super triggered when he figured out Sinister, or when they figured out Mr. Sinister was behind everything. Uh, Mr. Sinister coming after Nathan, coming after Madeline, telling her basically, hey, yes, you're the clone. I created you. She turns into Goblin Queen. They did that very well, and I'm really glad that they just did it in episode three because they could have easily dragged the whole two genes who's the real one out over the whole season but honestly like no i nobody has time for that you know and comic fans already knew what was going on so like the i i really appreciated the pace at which they got it out of the way they did the okay yeah no this is maddie Pryor. she's goblin queen and that whole battle in the cathedral was so beautiful in such 90s dialogue when Magneto shows up and he's like, give us the boy, you brimstone clone. Like, that's pure 90s. And what did Madeline say? She said, I applaud your magnetism, but my telekinetic charm extends beyond mere metal. Something like that. And she, like, such cheesy 90s dialogue, but I loved it so much. And when she threw all those stained glass window shards at him, incredible. Incredible. Um, they got Nathan back from Mr. Sinister, but he got infected with a techno-organic virus, which, you know, gives Cable that trouble in his metal arm. Um, and they gave Bishop to, let me talk about Bishop. I almost forgot about him because he sat out most of the season, which I'm upset about because I love Bishop. And he has such a good moment in episode three as well, when he Cyclops charged him up and he's like, time for an exorcism, punks! And he just blasted everybody. That was Bishop's big moment right there. Um... Yeah, he should have had more to do. I, I personally believe Bishop should have had more to do. I understand, yeah, if he had to take Nathan to the future to become Cable. But I wish, I wish personally that Bishop had a little more screen time. Because he was, Bishop's cool. I like Bishop. He's cool. Uh, so let's move to episode four, Motendo and Life Death Part 1. Motendo was such a fun episode. Because it reminded me, I'm sure it reminded everybody that 90s, uh, the X-Men arcade game. Um, I downloaded that i think i played the actual arcade game when i was like young 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 but um when i was older they released it on playstation 3 and i bought it and played it and i tell you i'm not good at that game i'm not good at that game if if i had actually had to put quarters to continue i would be broke because i died so often and you know what the wendigo in that game uh, side note, every single time, without fail, even if I was playing with a friend, or if I had a team of four, it doesn't matter who I was with, how many people were with me, every single time that door opened with Wendigo, he said, Wendigo, and he leapt right at me, and slashed me first, and he, he would go around everybody else on the map, and go right for me, without fail, flawlessly, I hated it so much, but, um, the visuals and the, the way the enemies and the animations looked and everything, like, looked exactly like that X-Men arcade game, which, uh, was such a, such a callback. Um, a fun episode with Jubilee and Sunspot. Like, I feel like they had their own little subplot going, because uh, Jubilee was, there was a whole, like, nearly season in the old show, in the original 90s series where jubilee was practically missing <laughs> like each new episode that came on i was like because i did a rewatch before uh this show came on i was like where is jubilee she's so she's always kind of been like on her on a little side questy deal and she, you know she shows up with the x-men when they have the big fight going on but um i think it was kind of smart putting her and uh roberto in their own little side story because it allows you to focus on them while uh, proceeding with the main part plot. And then Life Death Part 1, the second half of that episode, had Forge and Storm 
you know, reuniting, reuniting and trying to get her powers back. Um, it moved a little quick, but honestly, Forge confessing his love for Storm in well, basically half an episode of screen time is par for the course. Because if you remember in the old show, there was some guy from another dimension that fell in love with Storm after 24 hours and proceeded to marry her or try to marry her the next day. Honestly, if I was with Storm, it would only take 24 hours for me to confess my love and try to marry her. So that's not unrealistic. Okay. Forge was, Forge was in the right here. Um, but that was such a, I liked the Motendo part, portion because it was fun, zany nineties, uh, old arcade Mojo. Mojo is always a fun villain. Uh, just to get laughs, have a good time. Uh, and it was super cool to see future Jubilee inside the video game, voiced by the original Jubilee actress. actress. But we, you needed that because the second half of that episode, the life-death half, was so impactful and so, like, emotional. Especially, like, it hit me so hard when Storm reaches out. It's like, I am Storm, Mistress of the Elements. And she calls for the wind and the lightning. And she's like... Then she just says, please, and she starts to cry, like, oh, man, that, watching Storm go through that, like, hit me. Going back to episode freaking two, when she's startled by lightning, that, that hurt, that hurt me, <laughs> because she's Storm, you know, and she, you know, she's always able to sense it, or coming, or cause it, and then when it, lightning clash, and she gets startled by it, oh, it hurt. And then the adversary showed up in the end, that was a big, freaky villain x-men gets really weird sometimes <laughs> mojo him, himself is a super weird villain and the adversary that thing was creepy super creepy but after that episode we moved on to episode five remember it which, oh my goodness i hated this episode but like i hated it the way i was supposed to hate it so it succeeded in what it was supposed to do it was just hard to watch Bro, like, I, 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 you, I didn't see it coming. I, the whole <laughs> Genosha thing, the genocide of Genosha, like, I knew of it, but barely, because I had, like, read it mentioned in some other X Men comics where, like, 16 million mutants died on Genosha, and I, but I never read the comic it happened in, and so. <laughs> Is seeing that, seeing that fo- unfold in real time was just, it was, it was hard to watch. It was hard to watch. It was devastating. It was terrifying. It was terrible. A big tricep, no monstrosity just showed up and started blasting folks for no reason. And a ton of name Worthy mutant, Banshee, Marrow, Callisto, Sebastian Shaw, Moria McTaggart, like just blasted without a second. Like, goodness, we thought they got Emma, but she survived. Emma Frost, um, goodness, it was Leech was go- like pretty much all the Morlocks. It was terrible. It was terrible. It was horrible. Uh, yeah, they they had a, everybody's heart stopped because Nightcrawler got blasted and he got laid out and was bleeding like is nightcrawler okay goodness then magneto got blasted he survived but of course we didn't know that at the time i i i knew magneto was fine in the old series let me tell you something about magneto in the old series this guy literally like de-atomized he like faded from existence and then he re-atomized himself he shouted i live and he flew into space so i was like This is the same man in this continuity that re-atomized himself out of thin air. Magneto's fine. <laughs> but Gambit then, oh my goodness. He he went out like a G, bro. Like, I wasn't even as mad about Gambit. Like, his death honestly affected me the least because he went out like such a G. He, 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 char- he literally charged the entire thing, this big tri-sentinel monstrosity, He's like, the name's Gambit, mon ami. Remember it. And blows the whole thing out of the water. I know Bastion was upset. I know he was upset. That thing was racking up a killing spree. He was probably getting... He was probably getting all kinds of... All kinds of little Call of Duty rewards in the corner. And then Gambit just blows this thing up. Like, one dude. One little Gambit. 
blast this thing into oblivion. I was like, if if anything, that's the way to go out. But my goodness, episode five sucked. But like I said, it sucked the way it was supposed to suck because it was just, it was so it was so difficult. I couldn't I. I literally, after that, because I was watching them at midnight when they came on, I went on my phone and started looking up funny videos because I couldn't go to sleep. I just, I just, I couldn't get, I, that, I'm like, that's not an episode that you just go to sleep after watching. I, I need something to lighten the mood a little bit. Goodness. Uh, but yeah, there was a second half of that episode with more of that messy drama I was talking about, Cyclops. And Madeline in their little uh, mental affair there, which I believe was originally with Emma Frost in the comics, but they kind of mixed it up for the show. Then Jane kissing Wolverine, like, like a messy drop. Then Cyclops blowing up on that reporter, like, oh, thank goodness we're nothing like you because we're the reason you people are still alive. I'm like, get him, Scott. Goodness. Goodness. That episode was terrible, but like, it, in the way it was supposed to be. So, goodness. I, I, everybody was flipping out about that one. The, the fire creator of the show came out of hiding to, to literally talk about it because it was so big. It was, it was wild. It was wild. Then we get to episode six, which was, um, what was the episode? Life, that life, death part two was episode six. Um, it also showed that Magneto, not Magneto, um, Xavier was chilling with, uh, Lalandra up on the Shi'ar Empire. Uh, we got little cameos from Ronan the Accuser, and uh, we had the Gladiator, who I guess isn't, yeah, he's an X-Men character, technically speaking. Um, but we, we the, the whole Charles thing I thought was interesting um, because, you know, they, they were leaning. Because we, up until this point, like, they were saying Charles was dead. And I was like, Lalandra took him. But, like, did he die in space? And we just, like, was it off screen? Did we not know? Like, I was curious what happened to Charles. Because I knew, because she said in the old show, she said, we can save him, but we have to take him. And so when the Cyclops got his death certificate in episode one, I'm like, okay, so did he, like, not make it? Did did he, uh, you know, I was confused. Um, But it, it showed him uh, up in the Shi'ar Empire, he... Uh, came out. He was uh, he had his little walking armor, and he was trying to become uh, Lalandra's uh, new king of uh, the empire. It that was it, the the whole story itself was like a you know to pad out the life death part, uh, just to I guess extend the runtime and get Xavier back in the picture. But um, the most interesting part of Xavier's portion, I thought, was his classroom on the astral plane. I really, really, really liked that moment. I really did, because he's like, after uh, Deathbird took out his mechanical suit and started an uprising, everybody started fighting, Xavier's like, no, I forgot my real power, I can fix this. He just takes all these super powerful beings, like Gladiator, Lalandra, and Deathbird, he drops them in this astral plane classroom, where he's in charge, essentially. Like, Deathbird stands up and tries to fight, and he just throws an apple in her mouth, and he's like, raise your hand if you want to talk. Like, that... Like, peak Xavier, you know? He's just sitting in the front of the classroom, teaching a lesson in the astral plane. It, that moment was really good. It was really good. And it's, like, a perfect use of Xavier. That's when he figured out about Genosha, and it's like, I gotta get back to Earth. But the Life Death Part 2 had Storm and Forge attempting to get... Heal Forge, because he got bitten by the adversary, so they needed a special plant. Um... And so they traveled to this cave where Storm had to face her claustrophobia. I, I knew it was going to come into play at some point. I didn't know when, but this this was the moment. But then she got her powers back and emerged in the 80s suit and started zipping around and uh, beat the adversary, healed Forge up. Perfect. It was great to see my queen come back. Uh, then we moved to episode 7, which was called Bright Eyes, and Rogue went rogue. <laughs> She uh she busted up General Ross. She busted up Captain America. <laughs> no, nobody's nobody could stand in her way. Um, I I, I do think I w- will address the uh, Captain America was smidge out of character because the whole my hands are tied. I can't really do anything till the government gives me permission. I'm like, eh, this is the guy that went against the Superhero Man Registration Act. So I don't. I don't know if that would be the case in that given moment. 
but that was super petty of Rogue to take his shield and just chuck it. I literally out loud said, he has to go get that. Why would you do that? So that was, that was funny uh, and terrible on Rogue's part. But, you know, she was upset, right, justifiably so. When she told General Ross, when she busted in there, General Ross was like, you guys are supposed to be the good ones. Then she's like, nope, you killed all those. Now you got to answer to us. I'm like, dang. That was that was cold. They had a lot of cold lines in this in this show. Um, what else happened? Rogue uh, went after Gyrick, and which led her to Trask, who she was trying to get to the whole episode. That's when we figured out Bastion was behind everything. Freaking Bastion! Can I tell you? I hate Bastion. I hate him. I don't like him. Every time he shows up. I'm annoyed by his presence. I don't like Bastion. He's such... He's a moron. He's a moron. You know? He caused, he caused Genosha. He he did all that... He did all that... Mm, unnecessary carnage. And I, I can't stand him. I can't stand Bastion. Every time he shows up, I want somebody to stop him. Because he is the most annoying person in the entire X-Men lore. Either way... Uh, they found Trask... And Rogue dropped him off that roof. I was like, dang. You know, Wolverine said, oh, she just did what we all wanted to do. And then Morph was like, is this who we are now? And I call was like, what are you doing? I, it, it was, it was a little, I was like, okay, gee, Rogue. I like, we all understood where she was coming from and why she did it. But like, it was still like, dang, okay. <laughs> That's where we're going with this. Okay. Uh, then of course, Trask turned into one of, Bastion's Prime Sentinels and d- d- dog walked the X Men essentially until Cable showed up and took him out, um, which is good. And I, I, I liked that Madeline before she blew up on Genosha recognized that Cable was Nathan. She saw his eyes. She's like, "Oh, you made it!" And then Cyclops looked at him like real because like Cyclops had known him before, and I Madeline knew. T- Two knew him, but like through Jean's memories or whatever, you know, I, it was unclear when or how much they crossed over, but they each knew everything about each other. So technically, they both had known Cable, but after having Nathan, then they looked at him and like, oh crap, you're our son. <laughs> that's that's wild. And they kind of the old X Men show, the old '90s show, had a lot of if you know, you know moments. Cable was pulling up information on all the X-Men to get to know them. And he he told his computer, I already know about Gene and Cyclops. Tell me about everybody else. And, like, they didn't elaborate on it any further. But if you knew, oh, those are his parents, then you knew. Was, they had several of those moments. Like, uh, in the old show, Cyclops and Havoc's powers didn't work on each other. Like, what gives? Like, they couldn't hurt each other with their powers, like, because they're brothers. But they never elaborated on it. It was like... Oh, if if you know, you know. So they had a lot of moments like that in the old show. But uh, Cable rescued them from Trask, and he's like, "This is a whole problem. This is a whole situation. This dude, Bastion dude is behind it. We need to get ahead of this." Which leads to episode eight, which was the first part of the three-part finale, Tolerance's Extinction, Part One, which is something Gyrick said uh, in episode one: Tolerance's Extinction. Um, basically his bigoted way of thinking, oh, if we tolerate mutants, they're just going to overtake humanity. Um, this is when Bastion is revealed. He reveals his entire plan. Uh, he shows that he's it's more far-reaching than anyone thought. He's in league with Dr. Doom and Baron Zemo. Like, they're, he's literally, like, spreading his agenda. Even freaking Dr. Doom was like, hey, man, Genosha... That was messed up. Come, what are you? When Doctor Doom is telling you you went too far, <laughs> you probably went too far. Like even in episode uh, six, the Trask was running from Sinister. He's like, "Bro, kill me for what happened on Genosha." When Trask, you know, mutant kind's number one hater, is saying you went too far, <laughs> you went too far. It did Bastion. Bastion went too far. He went too far with Genosha. Everybody could see that, but Bastion had this whole speech about, oh, you know, I do something so big, so, so much, because, you know, humanity only has so much sympathy, you know, that they can give, and once you pass that point, it becomes apathy, and they, you know, 
they'll, they'll chill, they won't care, and we can do whatever we want. Like, it's just, he's so evil. He was just so evil. <laughs> That's why I can't stand Bastion. I don't like Bastion. I don't like Bastion. <laughs> I do not like Bastion. But episode 8, um, I said episode 1 was my favorite up until episode 8. Because, my goodness, this had... This had the action. This had the this had the team ups. This had the it had Spider Man. They had Spider Man in the he was only in it for zero point seven six seconds. Uh, a wordless cameo, but still, I got to see my guy. I could tell from the eyes and the chest uh, emblem that it was the '90s Spider Man, and it was later confirmed that it was. I'm like, yeah, you can tell he looked just like him. But oh my goodness, we had a POV of Nightcrawler teleporting. Which I think they did in X Men Apocalypse, the movie, but like it wasn't nearly as cool as this, where Wolverine stabbed the Prime Sentinel and Nightcrawler teleports, and it's just like this he's like pulling, and Wolverine like kind of stretches out as he just go, and then that, that was so cool. That was so cool. Then the Prime Sentinels took Wolverine up in the air, he free falls his way back down, just cutting through him. On the way down, Storm came back and saved uh, Roberto and Jubilee. It was such an epic episode. It was so epic. And this is when uh, Val Cooper, who was voiced by the original Jean Grey actress, which, by the way, which is pretty fun. Um, but she freed Magneto and he flew up to the Arctic in his boxer and he's like, enough. And he just shut down the entire planet. Which uh, it was another story I didn't read. Um, what was it called? Uh, Fatal Attraction. I never read that one. And I don't think I was even aware of that one. Uh, I was aware of moments from it. I'll get into one of those later. But goodness. Uh, Magneto shut down everything. Uh, and that's leading to the next episode. Tolerance to Distinction Part 2. When Xavier came back. Xavier came back at the end. Of the last one, and he did his to me, my X Men finally getting everybody together. They all put on their '80s costumes. I I gotta be honest, Cyclops is hooded with the gloves. It doesn't. I don't. I like this costume. I like the '90s suit the best. And it's not like Cyclops with a hood doesn't work. I like the astonishing X Men and the Krakoa era. Cyclops, and he has a hood in both of those. But it's just something about that '80s one with like. The it, it it looks too big over his head, and the there's not there's not much going on on the rest of the costume. It's just like blue for the most part, and he has the gloves and the it. I I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Um, so Cyclops little little, little downgrade costume wise, but Wolverine got his brown and yellow suit. Jean got the Marvel Girl suit. Storm was in her, of course, 80s get up. Roberto got his X-Men uniform. Jubilee got an upgrade. Um, I don't think Beast got an, <laughs> got an upgrade. Poor Beast. I barely mentioned him. He didn't do it. Beast didn't do a lot in this season. He got the Bishop treatment. Beast was there to, to provide the science. He proved Madeline was a clone. Um, and he had a little fling with the reporter, which I believe is from the comics. But, like, poor poor Beast. He... He, he discovered Sinister was uh, behind Madeline. It's, but, like, goodness. I, he, if, if any of the X-Men... I If I have to say any of the X-Men got shafted, I'd say it was Beast. He the Poor guy didn't have a lot to do. He never really had his, uh, like, moment moment, uh, I don't think. Like, he I've, he came in clutch with a lot of the tech and, you know, a lot of the solving things. And especially at, in this episode when he teamed up with Forge. Uh, him and Forge just became, like, the new science bros and started... You know, like putting everything that they amped up the Blackbird. They started make they made the collar for Bastion. Um, so him and Forge, I guess, I guess when we got near the end, him and Forge started putting out. Beast had a little more to do, but I feel like Beast kind of got shafted this this whole season. Um, he was he was definitely there. He was definitely present, but I just don't feel like I feel like every other X Men had like a character moment. Um, a lot of people though, though said felt Wolverine got shafted. He kind of Wolverine didn't have a lot to do, but like. Wolverine's been the focus of the X Men for years now, so I, th- I think that I think that's fine. Wolverine did what he needed to do. He was the best. It was at what he do, uh, what he did. Uh, so the X Men split up into two teams. They went, excuse me, half the team went to stop Bashing, half the team went to go stop Magneto and get him to turn the power back on because he was ruining everything <laughs> by turning the lights out. Uh, 
We got some super cool action moments. Gene versus Sinister was great. Sinister, like... Because in the old series, Sinister never really fought. He always called on his nasty boys. Like, Ruckus, get me out of here. And then Ruckus made some lame sound pun and like, oh, screamed. And, and they pulled Sinister out of there. But seeing Sinister, like, like, shift around and, like, be all creepy and throw his little flary cape out. Like, that was so, so cool to see Sinister. I really like Mr. Sinister. He's one of my favorite X-Men villains. So seeing him fight Gene... Uh, was super cool. And that moment where she's like, I fight with Madeline this day after Sinister's like, oh, I don't, you don't know who's who, I can tell you. But then he got Cable to attack her because he was in control of Nathan, which was wild. And he unleashed his telekinetic abilities. That was super crazy. That was super crazy to watch. And Cyclops and the gang going up to Asteroid M after freaking Rogue and Sunspot joined Magneto, which, I mean, I guess... Uh, that's, that's one thing, like, I feel like Magneto would have some brotherhood on staff, you know, like, he'd be like, hey, Mystique, (laughs) grab Sabretooth, grab Toad, grab Blob, grab Avalanche, roll up, I need some help on Asteroid M, these X-Men are coming after me. I feel like, I feel like, um, like, I definitely saw why Rogue and why at that point after his parents turned on him, Roberto would join Magneto, but like... I feel like the X-Men could have stayed a cohesive unit and Magneto should have had some brotherhood on hand to help him out personally. But um, Xavier comes back and tries to take over Magneto's mind to uh, which is against everything Xavier himself stands for, but it was such a dire situation. He had no choice. And then uh, Wolverine stabbed Magneto. I was like, dang, he got him. But then Magneto... (laughs) just just too tough to kill uh and he pulls the adamantium out of wolverine's skeleton which i was aware that that had happened at some point in the comics but again i had never read the fatal attraction story so i didn't know it was coming at this point and when he did it i was like oh that's gnarly that's wild jeez magneto jeez that was crazy uh which led to the finale uh Tom's Distinction Part 3, and what a finale it was. Now, I personally feel like it didn't resolve as cleanly as it could have, but they're setting up a lot for the next season. So, like, I I, I felt a little, a little, like, ah, that didn't really conclude. You know, like, that was a finale, but it seemed more like a, there's more to tell. Because there is. Because they left off the way they did. But, um, the rest of the finale was really great seeing uh just seeing bastion get knocked around by rogue it's like his name was his name was gambit remember she just goes full captain marvel on him because she's got carol danvers's powers let's let's recall uh bastion didn't stand a chance he, even with his fun little upgrades phoenix returned for like 30 seconds uh in the water and he, then bastion ripped cables arm off it was crazy a whole lot happened a whole lot happened. We had all those wild cameos at Iron Man, Captain America, Daredevil, Cloak and Dagger, Peter and Mary Jane, uh, Black Panther. Did I say Black Panther already? Uh, Doctor Strange. Goodness gracious. There were so many so, so many little little hero cameos just showing them doing their thing. Uh, goodness. We had uh, Asteroid M, Magneto and Charles in his mind trying to get him to come back to like remember who he was after he my blasted him got the power back uh to the world he's like magneto he almost shattered magneto's mind but like i say magneto is fine all the time he literally did the same thing he did in the old show after charles got him back he said i live and he flew <laughs> magneto's always fine uh nightcrawler put up fighting bastion oh i saw a lot of people saying uh they were worried about Nightcrawler when he was fighting Bastion in that form. I'm like, why is that? And it turned out that Bastion killed Nightcrawler in the comics in that form, which I knew because I'd seen the image of Bastion reaching his hand through Nightcrawler after he teleported onto it, but I, my mind didn't connect to that that was Bastion because I saw it so long ago, and I don't think I was even aware of who Bastion was at the time, um, but 
I was like, oh crap, that's that's why everybody was concerned because Bastion killed Nightcrawler in the comics. Luckily, Nightcrawler survived this time. But goodness, then Cyclops and Jean saying goodbye to Cable, and Cyclops unleashing his Marvel vs. Capcom doing the X and the uh, shooting his optic blast at Bastion. It was so crazy. Jubilee knocked Bastion around. Every Everybody had a beast in the Sentinel just, like, stomping on him. Everybody had a great moment. Then Cyclops got sweet in the end. The X-Men were all, they were ready to go, okay? <laughs> like, this rogue wiped the blood off her nose. The storm was like, it's like, everybody was ready to fight. Then Cyclops is like, well, hold on, let's, let's, let's extend the olive branch. I'm like, Scott, I'm not with you on this one. He doesn't deserve it. Um, then... Senator Kelly launched nukes, or President Kelly, I guess, launched nukes, blew up Asteroid M. Uh, the X-Men did everything in their power to stop it, and then it vanished into time. The X-Men were lost to time. Um, Xavier Beast, Cycl- uh, not Cycl- Xavier Beast, Rogue, Nightcrawler, ended up back with N. Sabanur, who's Apocalypse. Uh, Gene and Scott ended up with... Uh, Nathan in the future, so they're going to be able to raise their son, which is good. We don't know what happened to Morph, or Logan, or Storm. Jubilee and Sunspot were back on Earth, so I guess... And then Bishop came back, (laughs) finally, (laughs) and it's like, hey, Forge, we got to roll out, we got to save the X-Men. So I don't know what's going to happen next season. Apocalypse clearly showed up at the ruins of Genosha, picking up Gambit's card, saying so much death. Clearly, the horsemen of death. So they're, they've got threads. They've got a lot of things that they can pull on. A lot of things they can do. Uh, it's it, overall though. Um, this is a really good example of how to bring back an animated show. There are a few times where I feel like reviving shows succeeds because they kind of run out with it and you know do too much with it most of the time. I think X Men ninety seven really worked as a revival of the nineties show. Um, it was such it was such a good show. It was firing on all cylinders. Not a single episode missed. Uh, it, it was it was fantastic. It was a great show. I can't wait for more. I I want to see the next season. Luckily, they said they're like practically done with it. They're doing voice recording and editing at the moment, so it'll be here faster than we think. But Goodness, true believers. X Men ninety seven was such a such a great show. Um, go on facefrontblog dot com. I'll have a poll asking you what your favorite X Men episode of X Men ninety seven was, and let me know um, what your favorite moment was, what your favorite episode was, who your favorite X Men is. Um, until then, that's all I've got for you, face front true believers, and uh, I'll see you in the multiverse. <laughs>